By the early 1960s, women were becoming increasingly restless. Women could work for wages, and many of them did, but they faced an unexpected challenge. Once involved in the labor market, they became impatient for some of its rewards. They demanded better wages and equal access to good jobs, full-time work with shorter hours. They joined unions to get better contracts, and in some instances, particularly the United Electrical Workers and the United Auto Workers, they managed to win insurance coverage for childbirth and delivery. But their gains were few and far between, posing more questions than answers. How long would women be willing to work without reaping some of the rewards of wage labor? How long would women be willing to work without demanding that they have access to good jobs, jobs that promised promotion? When would they become hungry for jobs commensurate with growing education levels and at wages and salaries that acknowledge their dignity? How long would they continue to work as supplementary earners for pin money to help out the family? When would their job market gains threaten the masculinity of their breadwinner husbands? How long would women be willing to work without demanding changes in the family, for that matter? When would their continuing ambition burst the regulatory constraints of the domestic code? The contradiction between what women were being told and how they were starting to live their lives burst out in the 1960s. Perhaps it's fair to say that it began to explode in 1961, when a newly installed President John Fitzgerald Kennedy created a high-level commission to address women's issues. This President's Commission on the Status of Women, sometimes called the PCSW, came about through the Agency of Women. And though it's now not as well known as it should be, it's worth noting that it drew public attention to the questions of whether the seemingly natural roles of women might nevertheless produce discrimination.